afternoon, we have a panel, and it's on basically closing the gaps, overcoming the knowledge gaps. And in, on this panel, we are trying to look and reflect on the initiatives which has been done at the beginning with experiences from Humboldt Forum, Prussian Cultural Heritage Foundation, as well as the National Museum of Tanzania. We are aware that for most of us, that is an exhibition coming on, a joint exhibition. And we will hear on that progress as well, because it's part of the process on bridging the gap. With us this afternoon, we have three panelists. And I will start with the first panelist. And is Ina, Dr. Ina. And we might know Ina, <laughs> but she is the historian and the head of humanities of the Nature Museum in Berlin, the famous Dino Museum. And we will hear from her. She will give us a presentation, a short presentation. And I don't want to preempt that in presentation. You're welcome, Ina, to have your seat. And the second panelist is Flower. And Flower is a curator. She's a curator from the National Museum of Tanzania. She has curated a lot of exhibitions. And she told me I should end there. She will explain later about her CV. So I followed your will. Flower, you're welcome. Huh, the last person in this panel is Professor Carola Lenz. I met Carola Lenz as a student at Mainz University almost 15 years ago. So it is a privilege for me to meet her again today after over 10 years. So for me, I have a bias with Carola Lenz. <laughs> so it should be accepted. And we know Carola Lenz, she's a chairperson of the Gotti Institute. Are we, do we know that? Hmm? She works at the University of Mainz. And she has published widely. I cannot talk about Carola Lenz because when we were students, uh-huh, uh-huh, <laughs> we knew about Carola Lenz and the publications. You're welcome, Professor. So, in this panel, my name is Vicencia. I was about to forget. And I will be moderating this panel. And we will provide enough time for your questions and conversation. And that is our spirit. So please don't be worried. But don't sleep because you'll miss the opportunity. <laughs> now, Dr. Ina. We have this panel on bridging the gaps. And I'm, I'm aware that you have been working with experiences from the Nature Museum on this field. And I would like to invite you first to do that presentation, and then I will follow up with a question. Thank you so much. Thank you. 
Thank you for the invitation. Thank you for the introduction. I think it's time to talk about the dinosaur, and that's what I think I should do. I'm working in the Natural History Museum here in Berlin, and I, you visited me all on, mo on Monday, and it was really a huge pleasure for me, and your visit also inspired um, today's talk. So um, what I try to do is um, to talk about uh, labor, to talk about hunting, and to talk about gaps of memory. So let me start with labor. What you see here is a specimen of Lucaon Henigi, um, that is an African wild dog, that was named in honor of Edwin Hennig, that you can see here. As archival documents reveal, this dog was part of a prey that had attacked a colonial officer and um, is part of a huge zoological collection that Edwin Hennig brought to, together in the context of the so-called German Tenaguru expedition. In fact, we learn from other archival documentation that I have shown you that in April 1912, um, the head, August Brauer, uh, the head of the zoological collection at the museum, recorded that he had thanked Professor Janensch and Dr. Hennig for the entire collection that consisted of, as you can see here, 144 mammals, 102 reptiles, 902 butterflies, more than 1,000 beetles, and so on and so forth. Part of this yield being the wild dog. This dog has um, never been part of public debate and memory, as far as I know. It stands in very interesting contrast to those highly contested objects, which are also attributed to Edwin Hennig and Werner Janensch, that is, to the exhibit of the so-called Tenaguru expedition, Tanzanian dinosaurs that have been on display at the Berlin Museum since the 1920s onwards and that are among the museum's most famous and most iconic objects. Edwin Hennig, of whom we've heard, and Werner Janensch together were heads of an expedition that it extracted 250 tons of fossilized flora and fauna in an area around Tenaguru in southeast Tanzania. The expedition lasted between 1909 and 1913, at a time when um, this part of Tanzania was colonized by um, Germany. Fundamental to the success to translocate those 250 tons was the ex exploitation of local expertise and of local labor. Without the guidance of people who were familiar with the surroundings, nobody would have discovered those fossils. And without the hard work of the excavators, the preparators, and also the porters, hundreds of whom were working for the expedition, the bones would have never reached Berlin. This racist division of labor brings me to the second part of my talk about hunting or killing. It was exactly this division of labor, the white men just taking notes um, walking beside the quarries um, that allowed the heads of the expedition to turn into avid hunters. They amassed collections that would benefit the zoological collection of the museum, as evidenced by numerous specimens in the museum's collection up to today. At the same time, masses of killed animals were sent home. In February 1911, Hennig sent a huge amount of trophies to his mother in Berlin. So in February 1911, he writes to his mother, today and tomorrow I will finally pack a part of my hunting trophy. As far as I want to keep it, the museum will swallow everything else. And then what follows is an impressive list of prey that you can see here. Killing in this context became a sporting activity, uh, what uh, Bernhard Gisibel so eloquently described as a political ecology, and was moreover part of the colonial regime of violence. The thrill of chase occasionally tipped over into the lust to kill, as Hennig himself um, um, wrote in his diary. 
In January 1911, he writes in his diary, I carefully descended to the water as we heard the hippos. First wanted to take a photo, then it splashed close under us. A crocodile, it was soon my prey. I watched the hippos game for a long time, then the Mord Teufel, that's the word he uses, which I would translate it to murder devil or something like that. The murder devil rode me again. I shot twice, both animals disappeared without a trace. The others continued to dive up and down as if nothing had happened. All these dead animals were carried to the coast um, by men that also carried the fossils and were finally shipped to Berlin. In one of those many boxes, more than 800 crates that arrived in Berlin was the wild dog I've been talking about. This animal was shot in February 1911. And from a letter that Hennig um, wrote to the Berlin Museum, uh, I know that um, he packed the dog's skull and skin together with the, the um, skull of a human being that Werner Janensch, so he writes in his letter, had collected on the Noto Plateau for Professor Hansemann. The collection or the box was opened and um, dispersed in the museum. Lots of bureaucracy followed as always. Um, and this shipment record from June 1911 shows that the curator of the mammal collection rated the dog's skin as unusable, but the dog's skull is very good. The human remain was handed over to the pathologist David von Hansemann. The trace of this human skull is lost here. I can't find any more. And it's just as unclear as the subject's biography and its provenance. So um, this brings us to the many gaps. While the dinosaurs from Tenaguru are highly contested and highly visible objects that have been at the heart of Tanzanian German scholarship, and debates about justice, restitution, and responsibility of natural history museums. We also um, authored books um, in, together with an international group of scholars. It is only some experts who might know about the existence and the provenance about the mammals, the reptiles, the beetles, the butterflies that came from the very same context around Tenagru. So the story of the African wild dog leads directly into the heart of colonial collecting. That is a colonial labor regime, colonial violences, colonial logistics of natural history, the excesses of accumulation and the all-pervading nexus of racism, violence, and the translocation of natural or cultural objects or even human beings. This history is and will be part of European museums. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Ina. And I just have one to start with, uh, just one follow-up question. And it's related to the archive. Most of the information you have shared here are in the archive. And for us, uh, some of the information is, majority of the information is in German and some few in Kiswahili. And when we are talking about uh, bridging the gap, it's about also gap for knowledge, gap for information. How open is the archive to people to get to know what is in there, particularly those from Tanzania, previously Tanganyika? So, Part of what I try to do, and also the people who work around me, is uh, to is the task to open up the archive, which means that I would be most happy to share the documentation I showed you. Um, however, that's also it's always on a personal level. So what we try to build right now is a platform that brings together the bones of the dinosaur and the archival documentation, and translate the most important documentation. In English, I would dream also of Kiswahili, and that's 
I, look, I'm, I'm not happy that I can, or I'm not sure that I can promise that we achieve that, but to make it accessible and that you don't have to come to Berlin to look into those archives for one thing, and also to make sure that paleontologists, who of course work on those fossils, are very clear and can't look be, can't look past the colonial um, history of those um, objects. So um, I hope um, that's the first one of the first steps to to really make it more accessible. Okay, thank you so much. Let me end there and come to Flower. And to Flower, my question to your presentation is on the exhibition. Exhibitions are considered as platform for knowledge dissemination to exactly um, closing the gaps of information from the archive to the public. And currently there's an initiative to have a joint exhibition um, on the German colonial Uh, German colonial history in Tanzania, but in relation to the properties and heritage resources in Germany, if I would ask you, what should we expect from that exhibition? What is in there for people to understand before we move to the next session? The next question. Thank you so much uh, for the question. Um, we should really understand that uh, the exhibition which is coming is a process and it has not been the first exhibition or process between the National Museum of Tanzania working with partners either in Germany or within the communities. Uh, for the National Museum, this process has not begun with the Humboldt Forum and this is what should people understand? Uh, this has been a process since 2016 with the Humboldt Lab Tanzania, during the time when the Ethnological Museum was opening her collections to the public. But at that time, to Tanzania, it was only about the institution and not necessarily to the communities. So this project, for those who have read the Humboldt Lab Tanzania research findings, they could see how the university, the national museums, and the scholars who came to write and do the research and present their findings. So with the exhibition that is coming now with the Humboldt Forum is building up in the process. And to me, I feel like this now is the real process where the communities are being taken on board as compared to the Humboldt Lab, which was more of the provenance. So the most interesting part about the Humboldt, um, Humboldt exhibition, Humboldt Forum exhibition, first of all, I know there is contested ideas on how the approaches should be between here in Germany and also within the institutional relationship. And for me, I'll speak on the matters as a part of the curatorial team within the project, how it came about that it was more first of raising the awareness among the institution because we all know that um, not everyone within the National Museum was also aware of what the Ethnological Museum was holding. And we should be also, for those maybe who are coming from Tanzania, we should also be aware that the Humboldt Forum was not holding any collections, it's just a space. So we are having different actors in the project with different interests. And the National Museum for us, this is a heritage which is important and dear to the national history, but it has been not connected with the country heritage for so long. So there is multiple interests, multiple layers there, and also multiple process and experience within the team. So we are trying to build the rapport and the relationship first, but also trying to bring now the communities who were not involved from the beginning, with starting with the other projects first. So the Humboldt Lab uh, 
for the I mean the Humboldt Forum exhibition will be more of bringing the community voices now with the objects and the academic. I can say it's more of academic writings or literatures and reviews because the curators now they are not taking the position to make the decision only on what to show but also to involve the community voices on what they want to show so I could say that okay just one follow-up question and then I'll come back on the next round and open to the, uh, our audience. You have mentioned community involvement and community members. And one of the contested area when it comes to the exhibition of uh, cultural heritage and resources is the issue of consent. And that has been a debated uh, area on who should give the consent, who owns the properties, where do these heritage resources belong. For this particular exhibition, I would like to know, how are you handling, as a team, the issue of consent when it comes to communities? Because you're bringing communities to understand as part of informing them also, but also getting their consent. But I would like to know, how is it being handled? Thank you, Vicencia. Um, first of all, I should appreciate that the part of the exhibition that is already in the Humboldt Forum has come with this idea. And uh, bringing the communities on the part of the consent, at the beginning, it appeared a very complicated concept on itself, on how to implement it. But in the process of working it, with it in the field, try to now bring the voices of the communities, talking to communities, having the dialogues, visiting them, not necessarily calling them to the museum, but this time we need to visit them. It brings a different perspective. To us, as the curatorial team, it felt like we were trying also to bridge the gap between the traditional kind of knowledge with the formal education kind of knowledge. Now we are giving more visibility to the traditional knowledge, which is under the custodianship of the community themselves. We are giving more visibility to what the community really understand about their cultural properties. And to us, the approach itself as com as compared to the building history, as we, as I say that the Humboldt Forum, they are holding only the building. I feel like it's also the space where now the communities who are owners, their voices should be spoken and heard at that building. And now it's up to the Germans to see and decide what, after they hear what the communities are saying about their holdings. Thank you. I'll come back to the issue of depot. <laughs> that one will come later also on the issue on how these uh, resources are being held and where are being held and the, what are the consequences on how they are being treated there. Uh, now, may I move to Professor Carola Lenz? And mine is to invite Professor, just give us, you have been writing about this German colonial history in the continent and we would like to hear from you, what is going on? <laughs> That's a very, <laughs> I actually am not a specialist on German colonial history, uh, but rather on British and French, uh, because I've been working in West Africa and Ghana. But let me start with a remark um, uh, of taking up something that has been mentioned in the morning panel here that in both countries, I find that very interesting and very important for our cooperation, we're operating in fields of power. And I think you have shown very much in the morning with your remarks that um, there is a policy of the Tanzanian state, there's a policy of the National Museum, which may be not 
always completely in line with the government's ideas, and then you have the communities which may again differ from what some people in the Tanzanian National Museum think. And I think we have the same thing in Germany. We have a state policy uh, led by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs that deals with state-to-state -state bilateral and multilateral relations. And that, of course, an exhibition like this takes place in this very grand uh, field of um, bilateral state relations. Then we have cooperative arrangements between institutions like the Humboldt Forum, which is not uncontested in Germany, to say the least, uh, but which is still state funded. Uh, and you have in Germany the further complication to the uh, level of the lender of the federal uh, institutions that are not always happy about central cultural policies being formulated by the Minister of uh, Culture and Media. And then we have activists um, claiming their own interventions as being at the origin sometimes of some of the things we are now doing, um, struggling for funds. And I include among the activists also the diasporic groups that we have here who have an important voice, etc. So I think what that would be my conclusion, but I start with the conclusion and then step back for a moment to see the development of this. So I think what we probably need right now is sort of alliances and working relations cross-cutting these national boundaries at these various points, because what we can feel, find is that some of the diasporic groups here or some of the activist circles here are very much in line with some of the Tanzanian actors, but maybe not with government, maybe not with um, uh, a museum director or something. So that has the juggling and the difficult um, terrain to navigate, how to build alliances in the interest to foster more exchange, really dialogue, including controversies, but open and respectful exchange of points of view, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And it's not necessarily one container called Tanzania and one container called Germany, but it's rather cross-cutting these entities. And let me just take a step back to give a bird's eye view um, on what is actually the history of treating um, the issue of colonial history in Germany. Um, and there again, let me start with what I see now. I think a conference like this, a workshop like this, with the very strong presence of people from Tanzania who are engaged in accompanying, advising, etc., this um, exhibition project. Think back 10 years, that wouldn't have looked, the participants would not have looked the same we would have had much less presence of Tanzanian actors because you all know that it's very difficult to come here because of the visa problem. But maybe people would have given up much earlier. They wouldn't have devoted as much funds. So thanks a lot also to a civil society organization like Heinrich Böll to make that possible. Um, and to also engage in this networking exercise. So I think it's important to see that already this is a step in a process that is moving and changing, and it's already quite an achievement, I would say. Um, stepping back, uh, academics, scholars, researchers, historians, and anthropologists and others, since the 1960s latest, have done a lot of research on colonial history. Let us not forget that the GDR had a very strong uh, historical research on particularly German colonialism, which was partly due that scholars and researchers could not travel. So what did they have to do? They had to go to the archives, and the archives were in Potsdam, so they were accessible, the German colonial political archives, etc. cetera. Uh, in West Germany, too, I'm just, because sometimes young people say there has not been any research in the genocide. It's not true. 1968 was the first book published by Helmut Bly uh, on the genocide in Namibia. What happens is, uh, and, and that scholarship has been refining itself, has becoming more nuanced, going beyond simple dichotomies of uh, perpetrators and victims and, and having very nuanced looks, etc. So all that is there, available, growing, and, and getting new inputs, etc. 
What we did not have very much is any interest in the wider public for any of these um, issues. I think that is much more recent. And I just mention here a few points that were perhaps interesting entries into it. I think actually the first time was the centenaries. The centenary of 2004, the Namibian genocide, was something that the German government could not completely ignore. So that's the first hint of acknowledging that something was there that may be called Völkermord. I think it was not yet official terminology, but at least it was a sense of reckoning with that. Tanzania, to a certain extent, although the number of victims is probably much bigger than in Namibia, if you ever want to think of numbers, but it has always been receiving less attention than Namibia. Another interesting topic, we don't have to address that now, but that's just a fascinating thing. In Cameroon, also the uh, colonial crimes and atrocities have received much less uh, attention than uh, Nam Namibia, etc. cetera. Uh, but even Frank-Walter Steinmeier, then the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, in 2008, he opened what he called the Aktion Afrika. That was sort of a deliberate attempt of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs to open their attention for Africa as an important player in the multilateral power game. Did not mention colonial history. He talked about uh, importance of cultural cooperation with Africa, but in 2008, mind you, it was not yet on colonial history from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Now, I think it's a week from here, we're going to have the presentation of a book based on a research project uh, by the minister, um, instigated by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs on the um, Ministry of Foreign Affairs uh, and the colonial history. So that's a large way they have traveled too in recognizing that this is an important field. And one of the turning points in the general public, despite local initiatives that were alive and thriving, was actually the Humboldt Forum. That elicited a huge protest movement. And I sometimes get quite upset when uh, People, uh, I won't mention names, but some politicians now say that they, from the very beginning, have thought of the Humboldt Forum as something that has to deal with colonialism. God, no. <laughs> it was never the case. It was the activists, the no Humboldt movement, etc., etc., that forced the question of restitution of colonial history, etc., on this initiative. And fortunately, it did fall uh, on somewhat a fertile ground, and they understood immediately that if you build something like that in the middle of Berlin, if you want to maintain that project, you do have to engage with that part of history. And just to mention a last, and that's from where it started, and then when Benedict Savoie's very high profile resignation from the Foreign Board of Trustees, remember, you know, it's dripping with blood and all this, um, the objects are dripping with, uh, with blood, etc., and all this very dramatic terminology. I think that caused the sensation that was only in 2017, mind you. That's only seven years ago. So I think we have achieved more in the past seven years in, in public awareness than in, let's say, 20 years before. And uh, recently, when Steinmeier went to Tanzania and visited Songhe, it was mentioned already and asked for forgiveness. I mean, this is sort of just one further step, which I think 20 years ago would not even have been conceivable. But the important thing I want to sort of put here, and that gives me also hope, is that the to bring that into the official political sphere was a result of civil society initiatives and scholars who have been researching that for a long time, who also added their knowledge and, and sort of supported these themes. There's no dividing line between uh, activist circles and, and, and scholarly uh, research. And what I think, what we can now witness, the latest debate, just to mention it, it's not closed, that's uh, the strong controversy around Claudia Roth's um, new concept of memory. Uh, the memory work after the reunification in Germany has been built around two pillars. They were forced to accept a second pillar for reasons that we can explain if necessary, but not now. The one pillar is always the Holocaust and the Shoah, and that too is something that civil society initiatives forced onto the political uh, officialdom. 
It has not been the case that that has always been the memory culture in Germany, not at all. I remember being the president of the uh, history workshop in Göttingen, and we were then building that up from the bottom, from a grassroots initiative, and eventually we got communal recognition and then um, federal states caught on, and then in the end the central government started to support the so-called Gedenkstätten, the memorials. So after 1990, we had to deal with uh, the uh, SED, the, the Communist Party dictatorship in the East German uh, state, former state, and that was acknowledged too as the second pillar of memory work. And now we are fighting, and what Claudia Roth now proposed a couple of weeks ago is to open it up to five pillars. The third being colonial history and colonial crimes. The fourth being the histories that immigrants bring to Germany and their traumatic histories. And the fifth being celebrating also the advances of democratic movements since 1832, where there was a very first important democratic movement. And there was an immediate outcry by the holders and um, guardians of the Holocaust and uh, communist crime um, memorials saying that the resources are not enough to go and spread it to more things. Uh, the category of uh, um, histories to be remembered were of a different kind that we wanted to only fund um, state crimes and not uh, individual political crimes, etc., etc. So you see there's a whole debate going on, but I'm positive, and I end on that note, that actually the colonial history will enter because that's the only thing where the guardians of the Holocaust and um, SED uh, memorials sort of exceeded that, yeah, as a matter of fact, I think, yeah, I think we can accommodate that. So <laughs> what to wind it up is I think initiatives like yours here to bring people together like this exhibition, etc., are also important because it sort of pushes certain things on the public agenda. And we have to form these alliances, which are not necessarily in national boxes, but across national lines. And there are many things I'm not at all optimistic about in Germany uh, right now. Politically, there's no reason to be optimistic. But at least for that part, I'm rather optimistic. OK. Thank you so much, Carola. I have a follow-up question, and this is uh, basically on what you have presented, but to push this discussion further. If you look at the German reaction to its past, when it comes to Holocaust and when it comes to reparation, they are, it seems like Germany is practicing different democracies. When it deals with Namibia, as you said, it's different as it deals with Tanzania, the power issue. When it deals with other issues to do, for example, with Israel, it will be different. But they're the same people who suffered. Why so? Well, you will forgive me that I won't speak on the Middle East crisis here. Um, we would need uh, much more time, and uh, it's treating very difficult and complex ground. But what I think here again is that um, uh, I tried not to speak too much pro domo because I'm the president of the Goethe Institute, and I should, shouldn't be always talking about that. But of course, uh, an institution like the Goethe Institute that has 15 institutes in Africa uh, has been very instrumental in, in working in this, if you want to call it pre-political space. It's not really unpolitical, but it's sort of um, a space that is not immediately connected with government policies, uh, neither the guest countries nor um, the German uh, policies, but it has sort of enabled spaces for encounter, for dialogue, etc. So I think what you say is something that needs to be discussed and uh, I'm particularly happy that we can now meet, you are a theater maker and I'm now in f uh, partly in charge of cultural politics because I think, that's my word on that one, that it's precisely artistic and aesthetic formats that sometimes help us to bring 
these multiple dimensions into an experimental exchange that sort of allows for nuance, for new encounters, for new perspective, for new ideas. And uh, the Goethe Institute has actually, you have been working quite a lot with them, uh, also on the exchange between the different former colonies. I mean, you were in charge also of co-organizing this encounter in Yaoundé in 2019, where artists and intellectuals from all former German colonies in Africa met in Yaoundé and exchanged on their different perspectives on these colonial histories. And it was for the first time that Togolese understood that uh, not everybody was uh, necessarily um, reminiscency about uh, good beer, about good roads, but other people were really talking about uh, war crimes and about um, genocide. So I think that um, horizontal networking between different um, formerly colonized societies is also very important to change perspectives than here in Germany because it feeds back. Thank you. I know you have dodged my question, but I'll come back to it in a different, in a different performance. <laughs> now, <laughs> now, to you, Ina. Um, the do you know? When you talked about uh, Germany colonialism in Tanzania, and when we talk about discussing matters related to uh, Tanzanian heritage resources in Germany, the dinosaur is the first and the priority to many of them. But we know, as we are speaking, human remains might be, it is not might, it's our priority because it's a matter of urgency. Now, in the museum where you are, there are so many boxes, an opened one with the dinosaurs. I know you don't assemble dinosaurs in Germany, so that's for sure they are from Tanzania. Now, how are we going to deal with that? Because you still own the resources in the museum, which are unopened. What are the proposals? To take them back as they came, or to assemble them and return them back, or to manufacture copies? What, what are we going to sort about this issue? Well, there have um, been all sorts of answers to that. Um, the first um, claim for restitution or for loan of um, dinosaurs back to Dar es Salaam came in 1984. Um, um, it remained unanswered because of different reasons. Uh, the museum at that time belonged to the GDR, um, and the GDR, as um, Holger Stöcker has shown, um, was very reluctant to, and, and of course, as all the European museums, very afraid of if we give back just one piece, the museum will empty afterwards, you know, those kinds of, of fears and anxieties. So nothing happened. Um, um, I guess what we need is people keep asking um, those questions. Um, the, the boxes are unopened, but we know exactly what is inside because they were scanned. So we can work on the bones that are inside. Um, so we have the, the scientific knowledge about, about their, um, their contents. Um, but that's not an answer to your question because, of course, the dinosaurs are resources. They are culture, cu uh, cultural um, goods, um, um, which is a um, facet of nature that is easy to neglect and that natural history museums did neglect for the past, um, I don't know, 200 years, that, of course, if they collect um, nature, it is always culture that they um, bring and translocate from one place to the other. However, it's, um, I, th I think what is not an, I guess what, we are, what will come in the next couple of years is the same critique and the same discussion and debate about natural history museums as we have obs I've observed about um, ethnology collections in the past years. It will, it's only a matter of time, I guess, um, until um, also the politics of nature uh, will be 
vividly and um, most fiercely in the public um, debate. So um, I'm not sure how museums and natural history museums will um, be able to prevent or to you know react towards this critique. Um, what I can tell you about the Na Berlin Natural History Museum that is that it transforms itself into a place of communication rather than a place of collections. Um, maybe that's a strategy to you know put things into the depot. Um, yeah, let's see. It's a very interesting time. Also, I mean, we heard about it in, in the panels before, um, this whole discussion about biodiversity and the politics that, that are torn around biodiversity and why it's now that we have exactly to know which beetles came from Tanagru, for example, and why we need them in Berlin, because there will be one researcher once coming and needed will need to know what exact beetle that was. So um, it's it's very much the rescue paradigm that we had uh, for ethnology collections a uh, hundred years earlier. Um, so let's see what's what's gonna happen. And um, um, I think it's um, interesting times. Okay, thank you, Ina. Now, Flower, you have heard Ina's response um, when it comes to Tanzania, Tanganyika heritage resources. And she mentioned the issue of depot. I want to ask the question for the exhibition, which is expected to fill the gap. How did you come to select the resources to be showcased? How, what, was the, what was the methodology? Because we are talking about uh, bridging the gap. How was the methodology to choose this, oh, this property this heritage resource we will display, we'll put it on exhibition. This one, no. This one will look for consent. How, how was the methodology? Um, first of all, as I said, we are building in the process. And it all comes with the idea of having the exhibition about the history of Tanzania in Germany. So you can ask yourself, how should we present the whole history of Tanzania in Germany? without neglecting some parts and without making it looking like we are trying to suppress also some events. So the methodological part is also one of the interesting parts we are still working on because there will be multiple formats that will be brought into the exhibitions. But most important is about different approaches to the cultural properties working with the cultural properties in the different ways, bringing different ideas, people, and also um, trying to do workshops. I think this is also one of the, the strength of the preparations that we had, because mostly we know that these objects, are the cultural properties were not in Tanzania. So also for the experts, who are coming from Tanzania to work on these collections, they were coming and meeting some of these materials for the first time. So we should really understand it took a lot of time to really understand and fam familiarize with the materials ourselves first, and then to take the materials back to the communities. But before taking them to communities, there was also in between processes, the dialogues among the experts, and also the archival work. So there is a lot of processes in between, but again, um, the question has been like, what is presented in Germany will not necessarily be what is needed in Tanzania. So this also involves a different approach. So there is a multiple processes, initiatives, and approach in terms of the methodologies. And we should also be aware that the museum concept back in Tanzania is a foreign concept. So how are we going to communicate the cultural properties to the communities where they came from without bringing the umbrella of the museum as a light kind of framework, which was already established to phase them out into the debates or into the knowledge itself. Because 
cultural properties were taken from the communities, but not necessarily open for them to have access. And now we are about to take that back to the communities and ask for their knowledge. How are we going to remove the framework of the museums within that? So this is also some of the things that we are still working on, and we are happy that we have received also critical, um, um, I can say critical feedback also from other people, like artists, but not necessarily only artists, but also from people, other experts who have been working on the same projects. And we are also learning from other case studies. And we are happy the Humboldt Forum has been hosting also multiple exhibitions like the Namibia, so we could learn from others as well. OK, thank you. My last question to. Carola, and then I'll open for the question from the audience. Um, we have experiences when it comes to research that we have most of the Germans going to Africa to study Africa and publish. And we have less Africans coming to Germany to study Germany to publish about Germany. Perspectives. So, when it comes to the research, how can we fill that gap with this kind of colonial history, whereby still the Germans are studying Africans and publishing about Africans, and the students who are from Africa, when they come to Germany, they are being sent back home to start their own communities instead of being left to Germany to start the German community. How are we going to bridge that gap? <laughs> it's an excellent question, which I'm going to dodge, because I'm, uh, I'm not president of the German academic exchange system, but of the Goethe Institute, which is working abroad and not so much in Germany. But I think it's a very, very valid question. And let me broaden it a bit. And that is where, for instance, the Goethe Institute can contribute and has contributed. I think um, what we need to always encourage is multiple avenues of exchange. So that's what I mentioned with, I thought that project on colonial history, the burden of memory, it was called, uh, quoting Woye Soyinka. Um, was an important initiative because it opened up contacts between all sorts of African scholars, artists, intellectuals, etc., to reflect jointly on issues of common interest. And I think I would prefer to frame it in that way. Like, it would be interesting, for instance, when we lead our debates here on German uh, practices of memory, what can we learn from African practices of memory? You know, I was on a panel discussion on uh, Monday, um, a very small panel, where I raised that question, or I brought in, I discussed with uh, Teresa Kolomabek and Omri Boom, an Israeli philosopher and a um, East German-born, Mozambican, um, heritage uh, German scholar. And we discussed um, about this question of memory practices. And we felt that it was important to sort of bring all sorts of perspective a little away sometimes from these very concrete things and say, OK, how do other people deal, for instance, with building national cohesion in memory in societies that are multi-ethnic and partly also divided. Some are divided because of genocide and um, because of uh, things like um, the terrible genocide in Rwanda, for instance. It's interesting to ask how do Rwandans manage uh, memory, remembrance. And as a matter of fact, they do by focusing on the present and the future. They're not doing much memory work. And they are having state forms of memory and they are having family histories that run sort of subterraneously. So what I think and I firmly believe is in comparative perspectives. And in that sense, I would be very happy to have, um, let's say, uh, research schemes, etc. And I think some 
universities and some funding agencies are trying to bring that about, where we have common topics and then exchange perspectives from all different backgrounds. And that should definitely include Africans. And that would also include uh, Africans studying partly German state practices of memory, if we stay in that field, as well as it would include in bringing in, for instance, I did research on African commemoration of independence, saying, wait a minute, doesn't perhaps Ghana have a few examples that are very useful for reconfiguring some of the issues with which we are struggling here in memory practices? So I believe in this cosmopolitan exchange, but unfortunately, the playing field is not level. So we also have to work towards creating a more level playing field in terms of visa funding and all the rest. Thank you so much. Now it's time to stretch by asking a question. So if you want to stretch, you just raise your hand. At least you stretch. So please stretch up by asking a question. So or you can stand just to stretch up so you just gain energy. We have 25 minutes. Somebody has to start. There are no questions. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much for this very interesting panel. Um, I have a question for you, Flower, um, concerning the cooperation and what role restitution plays in this cooperation, if that's a big question you deal with when you work with the communities. Um, because I imagine if you bring the exhibition to Tanzania, and as I understood, to the communities directly, uh, and these are cultural belongings of the community, this must be very difficult, uh, or yeah, could you maybe elaborate a little bit on that? Thank you so much for that question. Um, first of all, uh, we should all understand that after independence, the National Museum was also going through the process that we are speaking now, because the museum was founded during the British colonial time. The collections were not collected by the Tanzanians or the locals at the time. It was collected or commissioned by the experts during the colonial times who were white. They also did a kind of racist documentation on the collections. So the process of decolonizing the museum has been a lifetime process within the museum structures and framework. And the restitution concept is not new to the National Museum because there is a case study between the restitution of archaeological material between Kenya, Nairobi, and Tanzania. So some of the restitution had occurred between Nairobi and Tanzania, and the collections were brought to the National Museum. And these were the two former colonies of the British. So to me, the restitution concept when it comes to the National Museum, it become a part of the agenda that needs to alter the priority and vision and mission, and also the strategic plan and the funding. So it's not a single event. It's a process because they have been working in that process for years. And we should all know that the National Museum, when it was handed back to the state after independence, it was given the uh, the mandate, or I could say it was tasked to form the national identity and to build the patriotism to the people. So when you are working with a collection from 125 plus cultural groups that you are supposed to create their national identity, but before they were presented in the exhibition in the contested way, like this cultural group is better than the other, and the culture from this region is better than the other, you really need to be sensitive and to be careful on how to work with the community in that stage, I can say. So the restitution is a process to the National Museum. Thank you, Flower. Someone is want to stretch here? Oh, okay. Where? 
Oh, that's good. Please, can you just mention your name at least? Sure. Hi, Thank I'm you. Charlotte. Um, talking about restitution, I would like to repeat a question you actually already posed, Vicencia, to uh, Dr. Inna, how you called her. Um, but I feel like you sort of avoided the answer. Um, <laughs> um, you said that the first, um, yeah, the first questioning of, of Tanzania towards the uh, Natukuna Museum uh, regarding the dino was done in 84 or something. And you quote, quoted a couple of reasons um, why it was not answered. Now we are around um, yeah, 40 years later. Why is the dino still in Berlin? And not only the dino, also uh, the other exhibits. And um, yeah. Well, um, uh, this brings me to something I've thought about when I prepared this um, discussion and it's it has to do with operating in fields of power as you said it um, or you phrased it um, it's so interesting working in a museum and in an institution that everyone tends to send to say I can't decide on that so um, and I very much had the exact quote in in mind because that's the answer you will get I can't decide if the dino is going to be back or not. However, then, of course, it's really a frustrating answer. And it's uh, watching the movie we watched yesterday somehow um, forced me to think of how much we can actually do within institutions and also, as, also from outside, of course, to force ins institutions to answer differently towards this question because maybe you can't decide on um, human remains to be returned, uh, but you can decide to use the aesthetics and the politics and the power of um, a specific medium to convey a specific message. So... Um, when you ask the director general of the museum, he will say, um, I can't decide. Um, however, what we try to do is to um, decide as much as we can um, as researchers, as scholars, and also as um, persons, as democratic persons, to, to open up the archive, to be, be a part of cooperation and you know, to make as much, to convey as much knowledge as possible to to make then one time the um, government and the politicians in Tanzania and in Germany to come to a um, close maybe of where the dino would best be located. Yeah. Yes, I'll give also your chance to ask Flower the question, Carola. Thank you. Karibu. Okay, thank you. I'm Thomas Fuß. I uh, work sometimes as a consultant to the Heinrich Böll Foundation. I would uh, like to refer to the title of this session, Overcoming the Knowledge Gaps. For me, this is the, the question or the issue, how, when, how can we promote, deepen, expand collaborative knowledge production and research on the entangled history of our two countries and how to address them and relate them to the present and to the future. So I would be very interested to hear now, uh, but you know, and, uh, in my eye, or in, uh, I have the uh, view of the uh, very important collaborative effort of Benedict Savoie at the Technical University of Berlin and Albert Guafon from University of Zhang. They did this tremendous two-year-long study, which is now continue in implementation phase, on uh, looking at the uh, so-called objects, the entities that were translocated, covering all of Germany. It's a, a wonderful, and the process and the collaboration of the teams are so relevant. Now we have two case studies here. The Museum of Natural History has been involved uh, on specific research concerning the diner, I would like to find out where does it stand, what lessons can you draw from it, how can it be expanded, and the same for you. Looking to the future flower for this collaborative effort, you know, of the uh, Stiftung Polish Kulturbesitz, uh, Humboldt Foundation, uh, Humboldt Forum Foundation, and your museum, uh, will this continue? What can you learn from it? How can you build on that for the future and even include more actors from both countries in this? Thank you. 
you're passing the person who has raised the hand. You're very unlucky today. At least now. Okay, thank you. And then I come back to you. And then to you, Carola. Okay. Should I ask that question? Sure. I mean, it's, it's simply building on what uh, Thomas just said. Andreas Mehler, Arnold Bergstrasse Institute. I did not introduce myself this morning, so I should have done that from Freiburg. Uh, actually, building on, on what Thomas said, I was also wondering again about the title of what we see here, Closing the Gaps. Obviously, there are lots of gaps. And you would never probably fill all of them. So all the more, it's also important to have a sort of a strategy. I mean, I, I'm wondering about research agendas and if there is something going on actually also in Tanzania when it comes to a research agenda, what we want to know from these bloody Germans or about the, the bloody Germans. Uh, I mean, that reciprocal gaze, uh, and Carola Lenz mentioned this, we started with that. You mentioned some of the things that are going on. Uh, it might not be enough, but there are starts to it. But to make it more sustainable, I think we need also something like research agendas coming from the more, yeah, the colonial, the, the colonized, formerly colonized things. Okay, thank you. Is uh, Valens in here? Yes, there's a question. I think you should consider responding to it after Carola has said whether there's a research agenda on issue of German colonial history from Tanzania, um, which can be posed. So I'll leave it to you if you'll be generous enough to update on that. Carola, thanks. Yeah, Flower, I wanted to know a little bit more about the aims of the exhibition on Tanzanian history. Does the German public even think that they have a gap of knowledge that needs to be bridged? Because uh, the task may be to sort of, and I'm sure you're in the process of addressing that, what do you actually want to reach with that um, exhibition? We have been talking about how it should be elaborated cooperatively, etc. But is there a demand for that? Or what is the aim? And I think if I think along the lines I've been outlining before, one of the aims people like myself and many here in the room probably have is sort of pluralizing and enlarging the German remembrance. I don't call it Erinnerungskultur, but bundles of practices of remembering. But whatever you want to call it, is actually an aim at making the German basic national narrative more inclusive. It's the aim of adding to the question of who are we. And there I would like to ask a comparative question which uh, was addressed this morning when I, we were asking about victims and perpetrators. And I think that is something, it's one of the difficulties we face now, and that's why the right-wing conservatives and extremists challenge this Holocaust memory even, because they say, we do not want a national basic narrative, a founding narrative, that puts perpetration and state crimes at the center. But that has been the official compromise, that Germany puts a state crime at the center of its understanding as a nation state, and that it builds its identity as a nation state around preventing anything that may repeat this kind of state crime. And that comes back to, I said I didn't want to talk about the Middle East, but if you take it more generally, that is the consensus among many, but the maybe 20% or so who vote for the extreme right. They want an other different national narrative. And in Tanzania, I've understood it, the national narrative and founding myth is actually founded on resistance and on uh, independence and on being proud of its own cultural heritage. And the question is, if we do such an exhibition, do these different founding narratives of nation states come into dialogue, exchange? Um, is the aim of the exhibition to prove to Germans that they have to include more perpetratorship into their national identity? Um, you know, there has been this terrible formula that free Palestine from German guilt, uh, to which I completely disagree which I completely reject. 
But that question of freeing others or how, what, what is, you know, if a national self-understanding is built around a concept of responsibility, not guilt, but responsibility, what does that do? And what does that, how is that framework feeding into, I don't think you have to answer the whole question, but maybe some idea. <laughs> I'm just thinking the big the big picture, but maybe an idea to get a better idea of what the aims are that you want to um, follow with that exhibition. Except a simple descriptive knowledge of Tanzania, which is of course not present in, in the public in Germany. Yeah, thank you, Carol. Yeah. Yeah, first of all, I'm I'm learning that German has multiple layers of history. And uh, sometimes when you bring colonialism, it's uh, one of the layer to many layers. And people sometimes tend to confuse that. And when you come with this kind of the project, like for us who are coming from the former colony, you are burdened again with the layers of political history and politics of Germany. So sometimes National Museum or Tanzania also come with its own interest into the process of collaborations. And one of our interests is to provide us access and visibility and discussions. And at least for the Germans, especially the children, citizens, to start talking about colonial history because it's not even visible when you bring all this kind of political history within Germans and past events. And sometimes we find ourselves to compare even the colonial history with some of other history which were even worse within the German history. And that's how it even become worse, I think. So uh, for this exhibition, I feel like um, each institution, they know what they are going about it. They, that means their own mission and vision and interest. But the common understanding is about access, visibility, awareness, dialogue, critics, and at least to make sure we reach everyone in the population to speak about the exhibition. Because I am sure that a lot of collections that are in, at the, in the ethnological museums are not necessarily exhibited to the public. So what we are speaking now, it's only few. So I feel like it's also time to have this uh, openness and access and let the people speak while also the Tanzanian thinks about the framework on how to go about the whole idea, I think. Thank you so much, Flower. Valens, are you ready? Oh. Can, can we give him a microphone at the back, if you're ready? You'll be the next. You. Well, I'm not sure whether I'm ready, but I will... Uh, I would respond. Yeah, um, when you talk of research, I was thinking of the same thing when I looked at the at the topic, and think of how we can bridge the gaps. And uh, when Professor Andy brought the question up, uh, it's all about research. It's all about collaborations. It's all about how we can work together to address the <clears throat> sorry to address the, the the issue on the table. But the question is, is it the case? Is it how it's done? Can we say we have projects uh, back home, say in, in Tanzania in this case, that um, largely address the, um, the issues that we are, we are discussing? Um, well, I can say maybe yes, maybe not. Uh, again, why? We don't have that information. For example, we were talking about how many cases are at the at your, at your museum that are not opened? And we discussed this when we were at your, at your, at your office the other day. Um, I'm a Tanzanian researcher, but I don't know how I can get access to the information here in Germany so that I can uh, write a proposal that will be deemed fundable and do the project. Another way, you know, that way around, if you say, okay, well, there are funds for uh, provenance research, but we say if you're going to get these funds, you have to get a German partner, and he or she has to submit the proposal. But we normally don't get those, uh, uh, those partners to come and say, okay, Valence, let's do this project. Maybe 
Uh, if you are lucky to be spotted, you'll be okay. We have a proposal that's already been done, funded. Uh, we can bring you on board as a postdoc, as research fellow. But that's it. Is that what we call collaborations? It's not. So um, it's the way for them is that we need those kind of, and especially when we are talking about provenances uh, in all um, human, um, human remains and even ethnographic objects. How are we going to get information from the people down in Kilimanjaro and Songa and other places if you do not involve the locals, if you do not involve the researchers on the ground? Can now, with the funds that have been allocated for provenance research, okay, Valencia, the University of Dar es Salaam, you can directly submit a proposal to access those funds and do a provenance research in Tanzania. That is, I'm not sure whether that's going to happen. But again, those are things that we would want to hear. Or if, there's, if, if it's, again, that's, it's not very possible, then we sit on the, on, on, the, on the level table with the German partners and then we... We, we think about that particular project. We come up with ideas and uh, objectives and hypotheses, and then we think how we can work on them jointly. I, I should not be welcome to the table that when the food is already re, uh, prepared, uh, please come and sit in with us. But you can eat all this portion for one month or two months. Thank you so much. <laughs> there was a last hand here. And then we'll get to our panelists uh, for the last round before we close the panel. Oh, there was a hand there. OK, the last hand will be there. OK, thank you. My name is Axel Hanna Siebers. I have been here with Heinrich Böll Foundation for many years. Um, and I wanted to expand a little bit on, on an as aspect uh, Carola Lenz brought in. And this was, the, I mean, the, com the comparative dimension of it. I mean, we have been talking about a dialogue in a very bilateral sense. It's Germany, it's Tanzania, uh, and for good reason, of course. This is at the heart of this, Ian. But I would still like to know, particularly from the tr two museum practitioners here on, on the panel, how d is, is there, do you have compar comparable debates or maybe even very different debates with some other actors who are in a similar let me call it post-colonial relationship, other former colonial powers or other African countries in your case. Are there some perhaps differences, some remarkable things that the German discussion could perhaps learn from and so on? And uh, so a, a bit broader, if it's possible, if this does not extend the scope of this too much. Thank you. Thank you. Can I get the last question? So when we just do the last uh, response, we can be able to keep time. It's here. Thank you, uh, Jan Dammel, Uni Potsdam. My question basically is um, related to the comment, we're all in fields of power, and um, in the earlier uh, panel this morning, uh, someone raised, you know, what interests come with funding? Because I, s um, so the question is, I guess, rather to the room, what, what to do with soft power and how to transform that? Because um, um, I see direct continuities like, Oh, I see that when performances are part of a, a program, an exchange program, like the one in Yaoundé you mentioned, it enables exchange, it can enable, uh, you know, uh, transmitting of knowledge about, for instance, that um, Komanile was part of the anti-colonial resistance during Maji Maji. But there's also the other side, the co-opting and the using it as a, as a tool for soft power. So I, I see this, you know, uh, line, for instance, during the British time, um, and this I learned from the work of Vicencia and her colleagues in Tanzania theatre studies, first the British sort of prohibited local performing arts. And in 1948, when sort of, you know, um, sentiment for independence rose, they shifted and they used and programmed um, Tanzanian East African um, performing arts, um, you know, to sort of, I don't know, squelled sentiment or I don't know, um, make it all happy clappy, you know. <laughs> um, so that's a bit my, and, and, and I see continuities to, um, for instance, you know, German institutions programming performance by African artists. And then this also has these, these political functions that you, you show you engage with something, but you don't ask the hard questions. You don't push those who are funding you to really, you know, 
work on the visa issue or to really um, put more effort behind restitution and reparation. So yeah, it's more of a question to the room, what to do with soft power. Thank you so much. I would, I would like now to invite Ina. There was a question which was uh, to you and Flower. And then I think I will ask Carola to respond to the last one so we close this panel from that tone. Thank you. Yeah, the question of comparison. Um, what we see in um, collections, so-called collections, is um, the uh, excesses of accumulation that, of course, took um, so the people in the field, the military officials, not only supplied the Museum for Naturkunde, but also the Ethnology Museum. They were they traveled around in Africa, so first they were in, you know, so of course the, the colonial history is something that we need to write cross-institutional. We need to compare what box contained what and, and then what, how was it distributed in, in Berlin, for example, cross-disciplinary because it's not only naturalists who collect na nature, but um, and it's not only anthropologists who collect human uh, skulls, for example, but it's, it's you collect whatever you can get hold of mainly. So we need to see beyond disciplines and then of course we need to see beyond um, cultures and need to compare that. So what we try to do is to um, first focus on what we have from specific um, former colonies. We had a, or have a project funded by the Lost Art Foundation and we focus on Cameroonian collections within the museum together with um, Cameroonian scholars to understand how collecting really worked and then also of course better understand how collecting in Tanzania worked. Um, so um, yeah, that's really something we need to do and also to share the information because in the boxes that came to the museum, stuff was, or artifacts, art goods was um, part of it that had to travel to museums um, abroad or um, in Berlin or in, in um, Prussia. So um, it's about the network and we need to share the knowledge and compare our knowledges. Thank you. One minute, Flower. One minute, Carola. We close the session. <laughs> yeah, so uh, what to learn from the post-colonial debates, uh, especially for the German? I think uh, for us, especially for me coming from the museum and studying at the University of Dar es Salaam, I have learned that we are not doing something new. In 20th century, after independence, this is what the scholars were doing, trying to bring the African perspective into the writing and the history. So if you look on, on the scholars who were working during the 20th century, what the difference is they didn't get the platform we are having right now. But they brought a lot of ideas, trying to change the narratives, bringing in new methodologies and approach to the history. How the Tanzanian history, especially about Majimaji, was being written at the time was horrible because people were still given names at that time. So changing this, giving the new perspectives and new first at least to fit within this, the, the, the scope of Tanzanian history for the Tanzanian scholar, it has been a journey. So for me, I feel like um, we are now building up into these dialogues that existed. For instance, in 1960s, there was a project within the, uh, the University of Dar es Salaam to document the Majimaji resistance. And this was mostly under the oral history. So we are not, as at that time, these people who gave the information are no longer there. So we are also building on those narratives. So I feel like the German has a lot to learn, especially from changing the narratives that existed from the colonial past. Thank you. Carola. Yeah, I would, um, well, thank you very much for that final question, for that last question. I would very much encourage you to repeat it when the Minister of State sits here uh, in the next panel. Um, as for an intermediary independent organization that I'm heading, I can only ask answer that I'm personally quite uncomfortable with the term of soft power. And I think it sort of uh, mm, supposes too much 
straightforward instrumentalization. And the political game just doesn't work like that. Our influence, for instance, in the Goethe Institute on the visa politics is almost zero. Um, and we are struggling with it and heading against odds, but we have no bargaining power. And mind you, what is important to keep in mind in the current German financial setup and political setup, since 2022 and the announcement of the chancellor that we have a Zeitenwende, a turning point in history, everything that is connected to cultural uh, work in the world has been uh, becoming less important, less well-funded. We've had budget cuts that are quite enormous. We've had to close almost 10 institutes and we will continue to have to close if the next budget comes as the FDP wants it. So that is a power shift and also a mindset shift that makes also projects like this exhibition uh, an important and very necessary exercise to remind our politicians in Germany that it's not all about weapons and that it's not all about uh, financial uh, support and direct economic relations. Uh, so I think that um, we have to sort of discuss that, but it's not that people have simple intentions then that then it works as they intend. Our counterparts often use the funds that we can provide them to their very own ends and means. And it's perhaps quite different in the outcome from what was intended in the beginning. And that's the part of partnership. That's the role of partnership to sort of produce results that have not been quite expected by any of the participants that engage in that. In that sense, I also wish the best for that cooperation and that exhibition. Perhaps in the end, the result will be something which was neither planned for exactly by the Tanzanian participants nor by the German partners. And in the end, will be enriched by everything. I tend to think positive. And the theater work is something you cannot control by any political agenda. I mean, they do what they want. They take the money and work. <laughs> so and that's good. I, I fully endorse that. Thank you so much, Carola. Thank you so much. Um, I, appreciate, uh, I appreciate that we didn't sleep. I didn't see anyone sleeping. And I, will appreci I appreciate Dr. Ina. Thank you so much. <laughs> Professor Lenz, my appreciation for being part of this panel. Flower, thank you so much for sharing. And for all our audience, we appreciate for questioning, for listening, for pushing us. And we have not been able to discuss further to close the gap, because I think that is an open discussion which we really need to push at, at least. We can't cover the gap, but we can narrow the gap. But well, that's my thinking. Oh, I, yeah, I'm looking if I will see any Maria raising a hand for, uh, for announcement, but can I invite you for coffee break and we should be back after 27 minutes. 27 minutes at 4.30 here. Thank you so much. Drink your coffee. Enjoy. <laughs>